Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to, to the discussion about the documentary First Boat, hosted by the Chinese American Museum DC. I'm David Uwe, Executive Director. Uh, we are a new museum in development in Washington DC about Chinese American history, culture, and all things Chinese American. Uh, we're also about making sure that stories and voices of Chinese Americans are heard. So this film about Asian American voters in battleground states is both timely and relevant, uh, no matter what side of the political fence uh, you find yourself. So today we are pleased to be joined by the film's director, uh, Yi Chen, and president of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, John Yang, and our moderator, uh, businesswoman and activist, uh, Yilin Zhong. Uh, first, we're going to just start off by playing a, a two minute trailer and uh, just bear with me one second and we will uh, get back. Being able to vote is a privilege. Not everybody gets to vote in the world. Asian Americans are the country's fastest growing ethnic group, but until recently, they haven't voted in large numbers. Now, they're finding their voices at the polls. <laughs> In America's battleground states, how will these voters choose? Make America great again! Woo! When I think about how I, I want more Asian Americans to participate in American political life, this is not what I had in mind. This is a democratic process. First vote on America Reframed. Um, if you haven't done your homework yet and haven't seen the uh, film, uh, we, we uh, will provide the link to uh, preview the entire uh, documentary uh, at the end of this event and in our follow-up emails to all the issues. So, um, our moderator, uh, Yilin Zhang, is an executive for Kaiser Permanente by day, and, uh, at, and uh, she's a vocal citizen activist superhero 24-7. So Elian uh, worked in the federal academic, commercial, and nonprofit healthcare space to improve access. Elian was uh, most recently a candidate for uh, Washington DC's city council, Ward 2. Uh, she completed her Master of Science in Health Policy and Economics at the London School of Economics and Political Science as a Rotary Scholar and a, uh, she has a bachelor's in anthropology from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And she is also a member of the DC League of Women Voters. So please welcome uh, Yilin Zhang. Thank you so much, David, for that introduction. Thank you to the Chinese American Museum for hosting this event today. And thank you to all of our viewers for participating. And of course, I am very honored to introduce our two very accomplished panelists today. We are very lucky to have Ms. Yi Chen and Mr. John Yang with us today. And uh, so just kind of a run of the mill for today's agenda. What I'm going to do is first introduce our two panelists and then we're going to engage in a conversation first with Yi and then with John, and then we'll have a conversation between the three of us. And I think David, you may be joining us too. And as a housekeeping item, we do have a chat box. So please feel free to introduce yourselves. I've already seen some great introductions, but also please feel free to submit your questions, which we will be taking at the tail end of the hour. And hopefully we'll get to many of them. So without further ado, I'd like to first read the bios uh, for our panelists and starting with Ms. Yi Chen. So Yi is a Washington DC based documentary filmmaker. She is a Soros Equality Fellow and DC Arts and Humanities Fellow. Born and grew up in Shanghai, Yi immigrated to the US in 2003 and this year 2020 is her first time voting. 
Her debut feature, First Vote, about Asian American voters in battleground states, is an official selection at the 2020 AFI Docs, Hot Springs Documentary Film Festival, Hawaii International Film Festival, CanFest LA Asian Pacific Film Festival, Vancouver Asian Film Festival, and many more. Also, the film is playing in a virtual cinema followed by national broadcast premiere on World Channel's American Reframe series tomorrow, October 20th. It's also currently on a campus and community tour across the United States through Good Docs and its Good Talk speaker series. These short films uh, has been screened, screened at the Environmental Film Festival, SAG Foundation Shorts Showcase, Claremont Ferrand International Short Film Festival, DC Independent Film Festival, Virginia Film Festival, and many others. She's also been featured on WHUT, NPR, The Washington Post, NBC4, National Geographic, Voice of America, and WAMU 88.5. And lastly, Yi Hood's an MFA in Film and Media Arts from American University, and she taught documentary filmmaking at George Mason University. She is a member of the International Documentary Association, Asian American Documentary Network, Brown Girls, Doc Mafia, and Asian American Journalists Association. So welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank and you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Yi. And now I'll go on to introducing John Yang. So as David mentioned, John is the president and executive director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. So at AAJC, John leads the organization's efforts to fight for civil rights and empower Asian Americans to create a more just America for all through public policy advocacy, education, and litigation. John has been a leader in the Asian American Pacific Islander and broader civic community. In 1997, John co-founded the Asian Pacific American Legal Resource Center. He's also served as chair of the Asian American Justice Center, the former name of Advancing Justice, after serving as a treasurer of the organization and as a member of its National Advisory Council. John was president of the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association from 2003 to 2004, where he worked extensively with the White House and the U.S. Senate in securing the nomination and confirmation of more than 20 Asian American and Pacific Islander federal judges. John has more than two decades of policy litigation and corporate expertise. He served in the Obama administration as senior advisor for trade and strategic initiatives of the US Department of Commerce. And previously, John was a partner with a major DC law firm and has also worked in Shanghai for several years as a legal director. And John graduated uh, from the George Washington University Law School and the Chambers USA has recognized John as one of America's leading business lawyers and as a DC super lawyer by law and politics. So welcome, John. Thank you for being with us. Wonderful. So that was certainly a mouthful, but I really wanted to capture the breadth of the expertise and the experience that our panelists have today. So without further ado, I'm going to move on to some Q&A with Yi. And uh, I, I, I watched the film about a week ago and I was just so impressed with the breath and the death that you were able to capture in I think less than an hour. And I, before we get into specific questions about the film, I'd really love to ask you about your journey. And uh, in your bio, you immigrated here in 2003. This year will be the first time you cast a vote uh, in the United States. So I'm just curious about your immigration story. What led you to produce this film? So let's start right there. Yeah, thank you, Elaine. Um, and thank you, David, for um, hosting this event. Um, so. Yeah, so I was born and uh, grew up in Shanghai, and I immigrated to the U.S. after college. Um, so that was uh, 2003. Um, I came here to attend uh, graduate school, and I studied film at American University. So last year, I became a citizen, and um, 2020 this year is my first time voting. So. Um, my experience as an immigrant and moving to a uh, 
a democracy, which is a very different political system from where I grew up, um, has really shaped my interest as a filmmaker to explore what it means to be American, particularly through issues around immigration, identity, and uh, democracy. So um, I started the project after, uh, in early 2017, after seeing how the 2016 election divided voters in my own community on a very um, deeply personal level, as you saw in the film, uh, you know, Kaiser's family um, as an example. So, um, however, on the other hand, I also saw an unprecedented level of engagement, particularly from first time voters. So this film first vote in a way is my personal journey and exploration to meet Chinese American voters in battleground states and tell their stories from both sides. That's wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I, I thought it was really interesting that you were able to bring broad perspectives. Uh, there were two characters that were more clearly on one side and the other on, on the other side. And I was rec recently watching an interview that you did uh, with the American Film Institute and you were talking about all the characters and the process uh, of filmmaking. So I think you started filming, was it in 2017? 2017? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I started uh, filming in summer 2017. I, yeah. I started the development process uh, early January 2017. Okay, so what? how did you connect with the four main characters and uh, what was that like? How did you engage with them? How did you build trust with them? Yeah, it was actually, how did I find them? It was a long process, it took about five months. So my first uh, filming trip was um, actually the first scene you saw in the film where uh, Lance in Ohio, he was playing the drone in his backyard. And then I went with him to his office where he recorded his podcast. So uh, that was one of the first, that was the first trip with him. So, um, you know, I really, when I started the project, I knew that I wanted to find characters on both sides and I wanted to find characters in battleground states so that was kind of what I set out for myself um, so I you know I just started talking to people I know um, in DC I told them about this idea that you know that I had and I asked them you know do you know anyone uh, interesting that I should talk to um, particularly I was looking for for first time voters, you know, uh, in 2016. So people, you know, I just, I, I met, I started meeting people. I started, you know, talking to them. And, um, you know, I talked to a lot of people, 20, 30 of them. And so none of them really wanted to be in a documentary. So, you know, I just kept asking for recommendations. Um, so at one point I noticed that there are uh, several people who told me at different times that they listened to this podcast and this guy in Ohio has this Mandarin language podcast that they listen to on WeChat so that was really interesting I was like who is that guy um, so yeah so I looked him up and um, so that that's Lance right I looked him up I listened mm -hmm. to his podcast so I contacted him so that's how I found Lance and Sue was also, you know, I also heard several people um, telling me that, oh, you know, this chi Chinese immigrant woman ran for Congress in, in North Carolina. So I thought that was also really interesting um, uh, as well. Um, so she won the Republican primary in 2016, but she mm -hmm. lost in the, in the general election. Um, and Kaiser, I found his, I was doing research and so I found his article, he wrote an article, why so many first generation immigrants voted for Trump. I was like, wow, this guy has the same interests that I have. <laughs> I should probably talk to him. Mm -hmm. um, and as it turns out that he actually moved, so he was born and grew up in the US, but he lived in Beijing for 20 years. Um, mm -hmm. And 
um, you know, and then he moved back in 2016 and he particularly wanted to move to a battleground state because he wanted his vote to make, uh, make a difference. Um, so, you know, and he has this uh, personal, his family story, how his family was impacted, his wife, you know, friend circle, they saw, you know, the, what you saw in the film because of the, the dividing the 2016 election. Um, and, and yeah, so I didn't know any of them before I started making the film. And, you know, I, I just, I contacted them and told them what I was doing and, you know, asked them if I could go and, you know, film them. And they all said, yes. Um, so that's how it started. <laughs> Um, and I filmed it for about uh, uh, two years. So I started in summer 2017 and filmed, uh, you know, I went back to Ohio, North Carolina many, many times. And um, so I filmed all the way through um, 2018 um, on election night. That was, that was like the last um, uh, day that I filmed with them. Um, and the film initially actually in 2017 started out with just the three characters, Len, Sue, and Kaiser. Um, I didn't find, I didn't meet Jennifer till early 2018. Um, so I was like half six months into um, production. Oh, I think we lost. Oh, so yeah, so um, so yeah, I met Jennifer in Durham. Uh, there was a, a, a convening for Asian American storytellers in the South. So I showed a, a, a short uh, 10, 15 minute of work sample um, based on the footage I had. And at this, you know, and Jennifer gave a talk on Asian American identity in the South. Um, so her talk really resonated with me because at the time, I was exploring this theme of identity and how identity shapes one's, you know, political views and how they how they vote. So, um, so yeah. So I, you know, I approached her. I told her that I was interested in going to her classes, um, and and you know, she said yes. So that's how I I found Jennifer. Um, so. Did you run across? Um any of uh, potential characters that had uh, first generation and second generation voters that you know, had different, uh, uh, came from different uh, political directions, like uh, parents and, and their children? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, it's interesting you ask that, David, because like when I was editing, uh, when I was working on the film, my editor told me that uh, his parents are actually Republicans <laughs> and I have an associate producer and she told me that, um, and they were both Asian American. And, you know, she told me that her brother is actually um, a Republican Trump supporter. And so they told me that, you know, um, watching your film makes it feel like that we can have this kind of conversation with our family. It's usually something that they don't talk about um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think definitely that's something that, you know, that the intergenerational difference in terms of political views, um, within a family, it really, it came up, um, uh, when I was working on the film. Which is often surprising because the ch children often follow their parents' political path, but it, it seems like, uh, I don't know how to quantify this. Maybe John, you, you, you can, um, the, uh, it seems like there are a lot of first generation Chinese, like you said, that um, uh, that where the second generation has has a completely different political view. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I definitely took away was uh, I think oftentimes from a from the external perspective, you don't know that even within. Uh, a community or multi multiple communities that there's such a breadth of views. So I, I appreciate you capturing that Yi, in your film. Uh, so I know we're kind of coming back up and I do want to leave you some time. I know there's something, uh, the website that you want to show our viewers, some educational resources that they can take away with them today. 
Uh, but just to capture all this, what is a message that you want viewers, people who've watched the film and will watch the film, what is something that you want them to take away from this? Yeah, I, I really hope that, um, you know, audience will feel after they watch the film that they will feel um, inspired and, and empowered to vote and have their voice heard at the ballot box. Um, I'm sure John will talk more about this in terms of Asian Americans being fastest growing population and we have um, 11 million eligible voters year and we can be the deciding vote in key swing districts. That's great. So I know you you're, you should be able to share your screen and Yi, if there's anything that you want our viewers to be able to see. And while you're doing that, I did notice you had posted a link to a survey that participants today can, can take a look at. So for everyone who has not ch checked out the uh, chat box, it's right in the chat box. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. We'll also send the uh, link for that uh, post viewing uh, survey out to everybody that is registered as well. Okay. Yeah, I just wanna uh, give a really quick tour of our website um, and there's some resources on the website. So um, as part of our nonpartisan audience uh, engagement and impact campaign. Um, so let me go to the resource page. Um, so, the main focus this year for uh, the impact campaign around film is uh, partner screenings, um, such as the one that we're doing now, um, to work with our partner organizations um, and mobilize um, AAPI voters. So these are some of our um, outreach partners. Um, John's organization is actually uh, one of our partner organizations. Um, and we have, um, resource links that link to the really amazing work that these organizations are doing um, around civic engagement. And there's additional resource in terms of um, uh, on, you know, uh, race and racism. Um, and, and we are also developing a uh, discussion guide um, as well. Um, and there are some really short extra clips, um, that's extra footage that's not in the film that um, uh, organizations and, and teachers can use in the classroom uh, to start a discussion. Um, and our long-term focus uh, is to develop resources for um, educators to use the film in the classroom um, and also for um, Asian American uh, organizations to engage voters um, in the electoral and civic participation every year. Um, here are just some examples of our, um, uh, the screening that we're doing. Um, and this is the uh, broadcast link that you can click on and you can check your local listings and we have social media toolkit for that. Um, and these, and after the broadcast, we have a lot of uh, community and university screenings. Um, I just want to show you this. Um, and there was one uh, community screening at a liberal arts college in Washington hosted by uh, their student organization. And after the screening, they actually did a student debate, um, which I thought was really a great way um, to engage their students. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, I am going to stop my screen share. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. And uh, just a, a last plug, but it will be the film will be premiering tomorrow, October 20th. Yes. Awesome. So, and uh, everyone is going to stay put. We are going to transition to John and, and specifically ask about his background and the work that he and AAJC are doing uh, at this time and what they're planning to do in the future. But then after that, we're going to come back and have everyone have a conversation. So thank you so much, Yi, for, for answering those questions. And I'm sure many people who haven't yet viewed the film will hopefully view it and also let people know to view it and especially watch it prior to our election.
So uh, John, thank you so much for being with us today. And again, everyone, John is the president and executive director at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. So uh, John, I, I read about your, your, your bio and you really have a diverse range of experiences. You've worked at a law firm, you've lived in Shanghai. And when we were prepping for this call, we all learned that we all have some sort of Shanghai connection. Uh, Yi went to Fudan University and then the two of us lived in Xijiahui, so small world. But you've lived abroad and um, you spent years in the corporate space and now you're doing a, a lot of amazing work at AAJC and you've been very involved in the community. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey and, and kind of where what led you to AAJC? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for having me on this. And actually, if you watch Yi's film, sort of you get a sense of what why a lot of us get involved in this work. Frankly, I found that inspiring to sort of re-motivate me and our organization in terms of why even small pieces that we do matter. So my own journey is actually similar to some, many of you that are probably watching. I was born in China, but I moved to the United States when I was around two years old. Uh, unlike some people though, you know, I was actually undocumented. I was undocumented from through junior high school and high school, and I didn't get my path to citizenship until the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986 that gave me the pathway to citizenship. So what was actually kind of interesting is that I became a lawyer before I had the right to vote. Uh, and so my sense of civic duty was a little bit upside down, if you will. I mean, I was already somewhat involved in politics in the sense of being aware, volunteering opportunities and the like, but I didn't have the right to vote yet. So for me, it was especially impactful when I got that right to vote. Uh, and was able to cast my first ballot and exercise those rights. And, and that informs a lot of what I do now and why I do what I do now. I, you're, you're right, Yiling, that I started in the corporate space. I had a law firm that I went in-house, spent some time in the government, but not at the DOJ Civil Rights Division or doing civil rights, but doing something that was re related to trade and commerce. What actually brought me back to the civil rights space, number one, is in some ways I never left it is from early on, I had always been involved in Asian American issues, you know, on a, what we would call a pro bono basis as a volunteer, right? Whether it was registering to people to vote, whether it was, as you described in my bio, creating this legal resource center for direct legal services for the Asian American community here in DC. Uh, but then after the 2016 election, you know, this notion of being involved in a different way really energized me. And I'll be honest, and this is consistent with my organization's mission. Uh, when our current president decided to run, one of the first things he said was that he did not believe in quote unquote illegal aliens and the fact that illegal aliens were rapists and gangsters. That was the blanket statement that he made. And for someone like me that was an undocumented immigrant, but yet I felt contributed to society as a lawyer, as a, in the government, representing the United States government, that spoke very personally to me as to why I want to be involved in the civil rights space in a different way and to be involved in the civic engagement space in a different way. And so that's what led me to actually start full time here at AJC. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that story. I mean, that that just um, means a lot. I and mean, every vote counts. A lot of people, I mean, people may not really feel that, but every vote certainly does count. So. Uh, he had mentioned uh, Asian Americans also in the film becoming the fastest growing eligible voters in the United States. And with, with the AAJC, I believe you guys recently did a survey on issues that are important in the Asian American community. So can you talk a little bit about what that is, what that means, and with Asian Americans becoming the fastest growing eligible voter block? Absolutely. So Yi said it, it was Right now, Asian Americans, there's about 11 million Asian Americans that are registered to vote. Uh, that is still just one snapshot. Right? There's still more that can be registered. And then obviously getting people out to the polls is important. So our organization, along with API Data and APIA Vote, which is another partner organization, both of them are partner organizations to Yeast Film, uh, commissioned a study of Asian American voters. One thing that you probably see if you look at the presidential polls at all, is if you dig into the details, they will oftentimes have breakouts by how people are voting by gender, how people are voting by age, 
And oftentimes they'll have how people are voting with respect to the African-American community and the Latino community. With respect to the Asian-American community, not reported at all. Uh, there's one poll that has been done by, uh, it's Garrett Yang, I believe is the name of the organization, uh, through, uh, th through another nonprofit organization that does Asian-American voters. Otherwise, there's no data on our voters. So that's why we thought it was important to actually have a survey, you know, a statistically significant survey of Asian American voters. And another aspect of that is to have subtabs. As we all know, Asian American constitutes a huge group of people, over 50 ethnicities, over 100 languages. So we purposely had designed this poll so that you had data points for each individual community, the Chinese American community, the Indian American community, et cetera. You know, on one level, the survey results are perhaps unsurprising in the sense that what resonates for Asian American voters is similar to what resonates for voters generally. The top scoring categories are always jobs and economy, healthcare, education. And that's true generally for Americans. But if you dig into these numbers, it's interesting because there are some places that people might be surprised. You know, for example, climate control, Asian Americans are strongly in favor of more government regulation to reduce climate change. You know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 77% in favor, only 6% against. Stricter gun controls is another area. Asian Americans overwhelmingly support stricter gun control rather than oppose it. And even on a hot button topic such as affirmative action, I know our community is very divided at times. It seems very divided, but our survey data has shown consistently over the years. We've done this since 2014. Asian Americans support affirmative action Currently, 70% in favor, only 16% against. You know, so this data is important just to understand what Asian Americans care about, what we think, you know, and, and what are these issues that we, and provide actual data rather than anecdotes about where we stand. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's really good to know because on, on some issues, such as affirmative action, you mentioned that there is a perception that there is some split, but I didn't know that there was actually now a, a greater proportion that is now for it. So that's, that's good to know to see how things are progressing and, and growing. So um, one of the questions that I, uh, or one of the, the uh, responses that I get for people who have watched the film is that they are really excited to see that there's so many Asian Americans, Asian American voters who are now involved in the political space. Are you, can you talk a little bit about how Asian Americans are, are getting involved politically, engaged, or even running, running for office? How has that landscape changed? It's changed significantly. So if you look right now, we have the most number of Asian American elected officials in the federal government than we ever have. So we have 20 elected officials. Uh, obviously, in this current 2020 cycle, there are a number more that are running, uh, you know, as far, literally as far south as uh, in El Paso with Gina Ortiz Jones. You know, there are numerous candidates throughout the country. Uh, and they're of all sorts of different types of Asian American ethnicity. So that's wonderful to see. The other thing that I look at is how our voters are engaged. And I do actually see more attention being paid to Asian American voters. That's been a significant criticism that all of us have had is that elected officials do not pay attention to Asian Americans. But yeah, and how does that translate? That translates into, if you look at political ads, if you look at the amount of media buys in ethnic newspapers, it's non-existent, right? It's starting to change a little bit. Certainly there's more that needs to be done, but you know, these political campaigns are starting to pay attention to different nationalities more. You do see more advertising in Chinese than, than you have before, certainly in Vietnamese as well. And that actually translates to better policies too. You know, one of the things that you know, we all often worry about is, especially right now with COVID-19 is, how are people getting to the polls, right? Because since these election laws have been changing significantly, you know, there's an increased use of mail-in ballots. What does that mean for our Asian American population? What they know about it? Uh, it is about one third of the Asian American population is what we would call limited English proficient. In other words, you know, they, they cannot navigate English as their primary language. And so it's making sure that we all have the resources so people know how to vote, how to make that plan to vote. Uh, and that's one thing that, you know, we're proud to pro provide is we do have a resource, a hotline for Asian American voters so that if they need have a question about voting, it's an 888 number, it's 888-API-VOTE. You call that, it's available in nine different Asian languages 
and at least you could get some modicum of resources. That's wonderful. And I just want to check in. David, do you have a question? Just checking in. Me? Oh, yep, you. Um, <laughs> no, I, I guess, uh, how, how are you reaching uh, the different political campaigns in terms of, 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 of helping them reach those Asian voters? I, I think the good thing is some of them are obviously, we're a 501c3, so we're nonpartisan. So what we do is we push out information, fact sheets, our hotline, to the extent they want to use them, great. But then part of it, more than anything, is just to educate them, let them know, here's the demographics about the Asian American community. You guys need to figure out what you want to do for yourselves with that. But at least you should know, right, that we have increased by about 139% since the, the 2000, uh, 2000 elections. So you should pay attention. To Yi's point, you know, you think about Asian American population in Wisconsin, it's probably only about three, three and a half percent. But then how much did President Trump win by in Wisconsin? It was what, around 20,000 votes, 10,000 votes? So certainly Asian Americans provide a mar can provide the margin of victory in all of these states. Mm -hmm. You look at Nevada, that's 9% Asian American, certainly eight, the Asian American vote is critical there. So we try to provide those statistics, you know, and then we do call out campaigns. If campaigns are making uh, racist comments about Asian Americans in any way, you know, and this is nonpartisan, this is bipartisan, yeah. we, we will call them out on it. Right. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, thank you both. And just one last question before we get to the larger group discussion is, uh, I, I'm very uh, pleased when I see that there is really more and more engagement. And for all everyone who's out there who wants to get involved in maybe the work that AAJC is doing or how can they get the vote out, what is an avenue that they can take? Can they reach out to AAJC and offer some volunteer time or, you know, what is it that you look for? Yeah, thanks, thanks for asking that question. And I could post in the chat box our elections webpage. So that will give you resources, both for that 888 number. We do fact sheets. I think we've done in about 12 or 13 Asian languages about how to vote. Uh, also, we are looking for volunteers for both the hotline. There are also volunteer opportunities, although it's not run by our organization, but I highly encourage it is working as a poll worker on election day. Obviously, we want you to be physically safe, but if you feel comfortable doing so, we need more Asian Americans that work at the ballot box, at the precinct, on election day. Wonderful. Because again, what you're looking for is people that, that have at least some familiar, familiarity with a different language. Sometimes it's just a familiar face. You know, e even if you don't speak that Asian language, you know, if you have an elderly Asian person coming into the ballot box, seeing someone that they can identify with makes that experience so much more comforting to them. And, and that's one thing that we think if we could help do and, and provide that civic duty, that would be great. Thank you very much, John. So now switching gears into our, our group conversation. And then after this, we'll take some questions from the chat box. So please continue to submit your questions or comments. Uh, so one thing that really struck me about the film was that there is some really great and deep insightful conversation about uh, race, identity, and what it means to be American, what that looks like, what are the perceptions. And there was uh, one character specifically, I think Jennifer, uh, Dr. Ho, she talked about how she teaches this in, in the classroom and she really challenges her students to think about this. And sometimes your identity, the perception of your identity will change based on where you are in this world. So I think I'll, I'll start with Yi, since I mentioned uh, one of her characters, but what do you make of this uh, identity question and, and how do you think, um, you know, what does it mean to be American? I know you talked about your own journey a little bit, but very open-ended question about identity. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so this, um, this, you know, theme of identity wasn't something that when I set out to make the film, it wasn't something that I, I, I thought that would become part of the story. Um, but, you know, it, 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 now it's part of the story because when I was making the film, actually, particularly going to Jennifer's classes, it, for me, it's like, taking Asian American studies classes that I never had chance to take before. 
um, and it taught me so much about um, you know the the, the social uh, and legal construct of race in America. Um, so as an immigrant, I came here as an adult and to attend graduate school. So um, you know I didn't have that uh, education that a lot of Americans receive at the, at the college level um, when, you know, particularly if a university has Asian American studies class to learn about um, Asian American history. Um, so it was really great, particularly going to Jennifer's class. Um, I went to two of her classes. One is Asian Americans in the South, where she specifically talks about Asian American identity in the South. And like she said in the movie that, in the South, it's so black and white, and where does Asian Americans fit, right? And then that book, Partly Color by Leslie Bow, talks about, um, you know, Asian American being, are Asian Americans colored? Are we, and a lot of times Asian Americans are perceived as honorary white. So this very interesting conversation and her students, I was so impressed by her students. They're so, great um, and they had you know wonderful discussions um, on the topic and the other class I went to was her critical race theory class where um, the class in the in the film she taught uh, the book white by law which um, uh, is a book by a UC Berkeley professor Ian Haney Lopez where in the book he talks about the social and legal construct of race in America so really like the journey making this film is has also been my own racial formation as you know what it means to be an American what it means to be Asian American and and something that you know I like I said it's like Asian American study classes it's free I was filming and it's like free class for me which is great I loved it <laughs> so um and yeah and when I was filming there you know, Silent Sam statue in Chapel Hill, um, you know, the first time I went on filming with Jennifer, she pointed out, you know, the statue to me and I looked up the history um, and I, you know, I, I filmed uh, some footage because Jennifer mentioned, it, you know, I, I got footage of him, her talking about it. But a few months later, uh, it was like August, that was when after the statue was taken down, I went back, I was like, wow, I totally didn't expect this. I'm glad I got that footage, now it's not there. So, and that really became part of the story line because it was a really important um, event that happened um, in Chapel Hill where um, three of the characters um, live. Um, so naturally, you know, the, the, that becomes, the theme of race um, becomes part of the storyline. You know, one thing about your documentary, I think as a viewer, you approach it trying to get behind the people that align with you politically. But I think the the, the more you watch it and then the more honest, you know, you see, um, you know, you see this honest uh, depiction of all the different characters in the movie, you realize that it's so it's really a wonderful thing to to see all these different points of view because you know i think there's a tendency uh to look at uh asian americans chinese americans as one monolithic you know uh, uh people and you know having all the same backgrounds and, and same points of view and perspectives so i thought you really did a good job um uh, balancing all the different characters so you could you can kind of see how they're all you know the, the similarities that they also have yeah thank you for answering that question he and david and john uh do you can you add to that a little bit and what you see in terms of the issue base and how identity might play a role into that well it's interesting i have probably two reactions one personal and the more one more more based on what i do Personally, it's interesting because as you said at the beginning, I spent six years in China. Uh, and it's fascinating to me because here growing up in the United States, 
I was still at a point here in the United States, actually, we're still not far from it, where I was constantly asked the question, where are you from? Oh, no, where are you really from, right? Uh, to that, that so soft sort of microaggression, what I, what I would call. And when I moved back to China, I went there as an adult working at, for an American company as, as an in-house counsel. I thought, oh, great, I will never have to deal with that in China. But in fact, I still got that both because I, my accent was probably still a little bit Americanized, uh, but more because of the way I dressed and, and, and all of that. And, or it was because I lived in Shanghai and I didn't have a Shanghai accent. So in some ways I felt even more American in China than I did here in the United States. And I, I just found that fascinating. I, more generally, I, you know, people ask me, well, so how do we get all Asian Americans to move in the same direction? And there's part of me that says, well, I don't know if we need to. And that's sometimes against my own interest, again, being from a progressive organization. But, you know, I think it's a, it's a myth or it's a fallacy to say that, say that we have to, because we're a complex group of people. You know, in fact, if you're talking about Asian American, and let alone if you're talking about specifically Chinese American, Asian American, it's a political construct that was created here in the United States to group us together. Now it's useful for us because it gives us a political power block, but we can't let that become its own myth, so to speak, so, such that we all think alike because there are very different needs among the different communities and, and we need to be cognizant of that. So in that sense, we should celebrate our differences and be okay with that while just thinking about what are the common values that unite us. One would be xenophobia, this notion of being a foreigner. Right. Uh, another would be language access, because all of our communities have different uh, language access needs. Right. Another would be, although it differs by types of ethnicities, is what the, the social economic uh, situations are. Right. And where our needs really are that we should be devoted to with, with respect to the United States. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. And so one last quick question before we turn to audience questions is what is next for you guys? You know, we want to know what's happening with the film and after and with John, what are you working on next with AAJC? So I'll go back to uh, Yi, Yi again. Yeah, so um, this year I'm, I'm really focused on the distribution and also impact around the film. Um, so again, you know, I really want the film to be, um, and I, you know, I think it is, it is relevant even after election. Um, like I said, you know, for, uh, for classrooms, for teachers um, to teach about Asian American issues and also um, for, uh, civic engagement organization because the work is not over after this election, right? We still need to continue the work to mobilize um, Asian American voters. So, um, so that's that's what I'm working on um, right now. Thank you, John. For me, it's continuing to do more work in our community, obviously, because after the elections, the, among other things, comes what's called redistricting. Uh, which is how you allocate political power within each state, within each subdivision. Uh, depending on who is president, we are always, well, regardless of who is president, we're going to have immigration issues that we're going to need to work on. There are discrimination issues that we need to work on. I, I will mention, I've been watching some of the chats, and I think it's great some of this conversation here, because one of the things is even within the Chinese American community, we do, do not have data that separates Taiwanese Americans from Chinese Americans that separates uh, first generation versus second generation. Because I do think there are some interesting things here. Anecdotally, it, it certainly, you know, at least my parents' generation, among other things, tended to be more Republican because Republicans were associated as being more anti-communist within that community that came over at that time. That's certainly true, I know, in the Vietnamese community as to why the Vietnamese community continues to skew towards Republicans versus Democrats. But then again, this is more anecdotally, I love to get more data on this uh, within the younger generation that it tends to even out. One other uh, chat that I found very, very interesting I would note is the notion of mixed generation uh, or mixed uh, ethnicity, mixed race uh, individuals. Certainly the Asian American community has the highest percentage of mixed race individuals, right? And so what that does to politics or civic engagement, I think it's too early to tell, but it's certainly something that we should think about is what that means to be American 
as sort of you get into the second and third generation and that they, be, those individuals become more mixed race. I, I think that's additional data that needs to be done there. Wonderful, thank you. And actually that's a great segue. I did see a question about how the increasing number of uh, mixed race generation will change the political landscape. So I think you, you kind of covered that one. So uh, we have really great engagement at the chat box and apologize for any background noise on my end. Uh, just before I get into the questions, some great comments. We have also the League of Women Voters DC has a nonpartisan resource at vote411.org for anyone who's interested in checking that out. Ye also posted the link to the premiere tomorrow in the chat box. And uh, so I'll get to the questions here. And John also posted the link to the voter survey. Okay, so let me just start from the bottom here. We have a question uh, from one of our viewers about, and I think you talked a little bit about this, John, is that there is, uh, in, within the Chinese American communities, there's those who are perhaps more on the mainland side and those um, that support Taiwan. And what are, uh, this is to any of the panelists, but what are your thoughts about Chinese Americans, uh, about these Chinese Americans, how they might lean on the Democratic side or the Republican side, or does, does that make a difference? Uh I guess I could start. I, I think from my understanding, Taiwanese Americans, especially true Taiwanese Americans right now, lean more Republican, or, or at least that, that skews more Republican than the general Asian American or general Chinese American demographic, because they see them as being the uh, President Trump as being stronger against uh, communist China. You know, it, it's interesting because I think President Trump has presented mixed messages uh, you know, on that at times. So I, that's certainly one thing, interesting thing to watch. I, I think the other thing is, again, sort of really getting into more of the data on sort of the generational differences. Somebody mentioned in terms of recency of the Im immigration status here and how that affects politics. The other thing I think we need to think about is sort of what that means for uh, how you look, what, what you brought with you to the United States, right? Uh, because if you think about what, the media presents in Taiwan or in Vietnam or in mainland China, what biases those people will bring with them here to the United States. And, and we could talk for hours about what sort of state, state spots or media can do to all of our own attitudes and understandings as we come here. But I think that's a fascinating thing to watch and to unpack why we land on certain issues the way we do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. And Yi, I don't know if you would like to add anything to that. Um, you know, I think John said it really well. Um, and this is a great question. You know, I, like John, I, I would love to really get more data um, on this. And, um, it, you know, Asian American, even Chinese Americans are, are so diverse and, and so, so complex. So um, it really would be great um, to have more data um, on this. Here's a question that I'm seeing. Uh, do we see more of this political, more political campaign specifically catering to Chinese Americans or Asian Americans more at the local level or on the national level? I would say more than, necessarily. Yeah. Right. I would say more on the local level, but that's based on geography, right? So for example, I live in Virginia, Northern Virginia, there's an area called Annandale where there's a high population of Korean Americans and Vietnamese Americans. So I do see more literature that's catered, catered, however you want to phrase it, to the Vietnamese and Korean American population. At the national level, I, I think it's traditionally been harder because they're trying to build campaigns around national politics, if you will. And you're seeing more micro-targeting, but that's still an evolving area, uh, whereas sort of local elected officials have a much better understanding of their communities than, than the national ones do. Mm -hmm. David, do we have time for one more question or? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Because well, we started a few minutes late. 
Okay, great. This is an interesting, I think this is a good question, and it speaks to the model minority myth. Uh, one of our viewers is saying that he is an elected school board member, and it's often difficult to get attention for the Asian American students and what they need because there is this perception that they don't need it. So what is some advice about how to tackle this issue? I don't know if you want to go first, or I, I could, I could, I, you know, and I, I want to be careful, I, at least for me, I, I would want to be careful, because I do think that you need to go to where the greatest need is, right? Uh, you know, when we're talking about Asian Americans succeeding academically, I want to break that down first, right? Are we really talking about Chinese Americans and Indian Americans, as is unfortunately often the case, such that Vietnamese Americans and other pop Asian populations need more help? And if so, we need to make sure that that happens. Uh, you know, and, and we have to think about what it means to be equitable in, in the society, right? Is, is the reality is that if you are doing well, so to speak, then your, your needs are not as great, right? And that it's okay that that level of resources doesn't go to those people that are already doing well. It might feel unfair at times, but I would suggest that certainly you want to make sure that the, 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 the people at the bottom are being lifted up because the people at the top, and we could have these social economics discussions, the people at the top, oftentimes they can find the resources for themselves. So that's the balance you have to make. Uh, now, I, I'm certainly there are situations where, you know, even in sort of when we're talking about racial justice or we're talking about immigration where Asian Americans are just left out, right? When you're talking about stories about immigration, typically it's a Latino face which I always say, that's right, it should be because that's where a lot of the immigration issues are, are really front and center, but we need to make sure to include Asian Americans as well. I think that's the same thing on all of these spaces is, yes, it's okay to center. And in fact, we should let the black community lead, but let's make sure that we still have a voice in that as well. Yeah. Thank you for that. And we did have some questions in the chat and we responded. She has a, a panel coming up this week with the four characters. So if you're really, if you're interested and have viewed or will view the film, that's where you can learn a little bit more about their stories. So I think I'm going to pass it to you, David, with any yeah. closing remarks and apologies if we didn't get to your question fully, but uh, I'm sure there will be, our, our panelists would be more than happy to take those questions after. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you for everyone to, uh, for attending. Uh, special thank you to Yi Chen and John Yang and, uh, and, and Yilin. Yeah, th thank you for all three of you really um, for your work to make sure that uh, Asian American voices are heard on the political stage. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Yi, for you know, making such a wonderful film that you know, really shows the diversity and depth of uh, of these Chinese American voters. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the film or to, um, uh, to watch the full version of the film, we're gonna put up uh, uh, some links on the screen and then we'll also follow up with um, some emails to all the registrants. So uh, if you don't catch it on the slide, don't worry about it. Uh, but um, uh, this event has also been being recorded. So, um, if you wanted to watch it again, or if you want to pass it along to someone, uh, they'll, we'll be sharing those links. And uh, let me just uh, put up these, this slide that I'm talking about. Everybody should be able to read that. So um, to, to support the Chinese American Museum or programs like these, you can visit the museum online. Um, and uh, you know your contributions help us move towards building a sustainable institution uh, dedicated to the Chinese American experience. And uh, please um, pass along the link um, for uh, the film, uh, the second line here, and then also you know uh, uh, the, the good work that uh, AAJC is is doing. So uh, thank you so much for everyone uh, for joining, and um, have a great day. Thank you, David. Thank you, Eileen. Thank, Thank you, you. Yi. Thank you, John. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Take care.